the most exciting team to watch this season in the Premier League. The manager appointment might go down as the best move of the year. Europe possibly beckons for this team next season if they keep the same names at the football club. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Player Zone YouTube channel and welcome to our Crystal Palace season review, season recap and what a turnaround it was this season. The Oliver Glasner revolution is alive and kicking at Crystal Palace right now and they produce one of the most exciting back half at the end of the season which we have seen. Obviously the video on the channel is blowing up in terms of how I've gone about analysing the turnaround at Oliver Glasner but it's been one of the most exciting things for me. I've touched on many teams like Bournemouth, um, like the excitement scene with Girona and Bologna over in other legs. But Crystal Palace has arguably been the most quickest turnaround, the quickest revolution we've seen this season. And it's been super exciting. And you can see how much they value in the club right now, putting a £100 million release clause on Oliver Glasner's contract. You cannot get him away from the club. And what a move it was. You know, At the time, we were questioning if Roy Hodgson getting rid of him was the you know, right way to go forward. I know it wasn't the progressive style of football, but he was a results man. But ever since Oliver Glasner's has come in, the turnaround has been fantastic. The points, the goals, the style of football has all changed in a positive way. And it's ended up being one of the greatest end of the season we've seen out of most teams. I think you'd be up there in the top five or six clubs for their back half. Their last three months um, on a Premier League ladder for the last three months of the season was up there with the likes of Chelsea um, and the likes of the Bournemouth. And obviously the big two being Man City um, Arsenal and also Liverpool as well. So the turnaround has been fantastic. And at certain players which have stood out as well, which I've got to touch on here in this video here. Looking at their season record, they finished with a record of 13 wins. The 10 draws and the 15 losses, giving them 49 points and finishing smack bang in 10th, overtaking the likes of Brighton, being right behind West Ham um, and going clear of the likes of Bournemouth as well, who were well and truly ahead of them um, come to the last three to four months of the season. They turned it around. Um, and boy, was it a turnaround and a half. Let's look at their best signing. Someone that's been key in this turnaround um, is Daniel Munoz. The 8 million euro fee from Genk. Made the 16 appearances this season, um, the four assists. But what, boy, what a fullback he's become under the Glasner system. Someone that is very comfortable in the ball um, and is really important in transitional play where they can win the ball back and get the ball directly and quickly into midfield areas. He can make a pass. He's very good overlapping on the flank. Um, and it's not someone that can easily be passed. He's not the biggest build. He's not the quickest guy. But the way he covers ground, closes spaces, uh, and most importantly in transitional play, if they turn the ball over with how high they press, um, he can get back and get into the shape really, really well. And I feel like someone that's underused under Oliver Glasner, um, under Roy Hodgson, but under Oliver Glasner, was really, really pivotal to the system, especially in a fire back or a fall back at times, wherever they reverted to um, on the day. I feel like he's someone that just lifted and lifted as the season went on. And you give him now a full season next year, I think we'll see one of the most consistent and underrated fullbacks um, in the league where he'll develop there. Really, really handy at right back. Really important for this new system. And especially if they play this five-back system, his ability to get up and get assists and his comfort on the ball to find a pass will be so important. You think assists in, every, um, in a quarter of his games he appeared in says a lot about the player. He's got that um, ability in the final third. We see he did it for a Columbia as well in the friendlies not too long ago as well. He can get forward, he can get it um, to the bar line, get some dangerous balls into the air. And you've got Odson Edouard and you've got um, John Philippe Mateta, especially in the form he's in. You want someone like a Munoz from the flank to whip those balls into the area. So he's been very, very good for me and easy, one of the best value for money signings this season. The worst signing is probably Mateus Franca, £26 million. Pounds. Only made... Uh, 20, uh, made a few appearances with a 24 minutes averaging per game. Got the one assist. A very talented player, someone for the future, but just didn't feature as much in this side as we probably hoped. Probably not someone that fit the Roy Hodgson system, but coming into this new era on, on, on Oliver Glasner, you might see him evolve a little bit more. We're starting to see him a little bit more as the season came to an end. But when you got the form of um, Will Hughes and Adam Wharton, that midfield, that's very hard to break in and we know what IU can do in terms of his experience, his work rate. So it's very hard to crack into this side. So I just think for the money, a little bit of a um, rash spend in the end. Obviously, someone for the future, we cannot wait to see what he can produce. And if the likes of Eze and Elise are on the way out, this guy will come and have to fill that sort of mould as an attacking midfielder, someone who can maybe drift out wide and can create from those wide areas. You know, there's a lot of wrap around him with what he can do. He his special nature in the ball. We just didn't get to see that this season. So he probably goes down as the worst signing for me, unfortunately. Um, and that brings me now to the moment of the season. And there's a lot of big moments come the back end, but probably the number one has to be 
um, Eberese Eze's goal versus Liverpool at Anfield for the 1-0 win. This was not just down to him, but it was the team goal. The build-up play was fantastic. We're thinking about touches from Wharton, from Hughes, from Tarek Mitchell, from Elise. I think uh, Matessa dropped in for a touch in the build-up as well. And it just became from back to front. And it was just a symbol of what Crystal Palace had come um, under Oliver Glazer, playing through Liverpool's press, playing past McAllister and Endo, skipping through the back line, exposing that back four, playing through the lines. Mitchell gets the ball in the, the end of the bar line, cuts the ball back to Eze on the six-yard box and smacked it home to make it 1-0. And that ended end up being the winning goal at Anfield there. A massive result at Anfield. Probably ended Liverpool's title hopes as well. So what an occasion to do it. What a goal. What a great build-up. And when I watched that game and I watched how they pieced apart Liverpool, uh, at that point in time, it was Liverpool's in the title race. Palace were starting to see some signs. It was a very positive tick in my box for me. That sort of started my real interest in this side and what they were doing under Oliver Glasnan. It was a consistent ability to press high up the pitch when they needed to, but also revert back and drop in deep and sit in a low block when they knew they were not quite in control of games. They were really good at adapting situations. I touched on a Wolves game late in the season where they won quite comfortably if they won away from home. But when Wolves were on top, they sat in that low block. They sat with sort of five... Um, and along the back line there. But when they had the opportunity, they pressed high up the pitch. The Whartons, um, the, the Eze's and the Elise has working hard hard to win the ball back. John Philippe Mateta, fantastic in running off the ball and pressing high up the pitch. Then you get the ball into Tyreek Mitchell and Munoz. Let them transition with the play. Get the ball in midfield areas. Spring the counter attack. You get Elise, Eze and John Philippe Mateta all on the score sheet. That's just what they became. They became a high energy, high pressing, very fluid team that is very solid at the back. And priorities to go forward. That was the switch when uh, Glasner came in versus uh, Roy Hodgson. It was a real shift to be front-minded, front-footed. And you see the results that came from that. Um, coming to our breakout player, and this guy I could talk about all day long. He's just recently put into the Euro provisional squad. It's Adam Wharton. Fantastic since coming from Blackburn. The 7.09 safer score rating. Three assists in 16 games. Averaging the 1.3 interceptions, the three tackles, and the 4.8 ball recoveries from midfield. But it's not only the defensive work he does and the pressing work he does. He is magical with the ball at his feet. Uh, again, in that Wolves game, a massive assist from there. His weight of pass is fantastic. His vision um, is so good for making the ground massive, especially with the likes of Eze and Elise on those flanks. To find them in wide areas and let them do the running, send them up from deep line positions is fantastic. If him and Will Hughes continue to play the way they're playing, there's nothing stopping Palace from absolutely breaking into those European positions because the work they do not only defensively but attackingly just makes it impossible to stop because you end up outrunning, outworking midfielders amongst the Premier League. And I think the difference Alan Wharton's got, having that championship experience, dealing with the physicality and pace, when it comes to the Premier League, he's unfazed by that pace and power where a lot of our young players take some time to adjust, take some time to get used to the physicality. And to be honest, I think he's ahead of Lewis Marley. I think he's ahead of Kobe Marley and his ability to see the game. I think that's the difference for him. Um, if you can add some more goals to his game as well, obviously a bit harder from that deep line position, but... That makes him head and shoulders of those two guys. And considering there's so much wrap around Kobe Manu as the Manchester United star boy, young boy, look at Adam Wharton. This guy, if he was at any of the big four teams, we raid as the next Lampard, the next Gerrard, the next Scholes, because he's got it all. He literally has got it all. If he plays in a more progressive team, if you play him at the eight, I think you'll have goals in this game. His passing is second to none. He's an energizer bunny there, pressing, getting in people's faces, making great tackles. The stats all show that. And has not put in a bad performance since joining Palace mid-season as well. A great adjustment. I think it will become Oliver Glasner's number one pick each week in, week out because of what he does and just been fantastic for me. A great value for money signing in the mid-season. So he's definitely the breakout player for me. Coming to the play of the season, it's hard. A lot of players in and out, a few good performances come the back end of the season, but has to be Michael Elise for me, the 10 goals, 6 assists in only 14 starts, so 16 goal contributions among the 14 starts. Um, doesn't lose when he plays, basically. Palace are so much more better with, with him there. And you see the difference. When he's not there, they have a big drop-off. When him and Eze are both not there, they struggle. But when Eze is there and Elise is not there, they're still not at their best. But when you have Elise on this side here, the work he does on the ball, his ability to find space, they'll jink inside, jink outside, um, and again, he attempts the ridiculous and normally pulls it off. That's the biggest thing. And there's a reason why a lot of the big clubs around Europe are after him and Manchester United are after him as well, because I'd love to see him at Manchester United. The ability he has on the ball, you've got some other hard workers around him. And when you see now that John Philippe Matet is in some great form, he gets the assists as well. He can find um, the clinical number nine as well. Someone that's made for a big club the way he plays his football. Yes, he can be wasteful at times, but can you know win a game with his own magical foot. You know, he's 
when the ball at his feet, there's not many like him. There's not many that can stop him. It's that X factor. It's that difference maker. And when you get him in the final third, defenders are, are praying for help. You're going to have to double him, overload those areas to stop him because when he gets his head down running, when he can stand a defender up, it's good night. With that skill, with that ability to find the back of the net as well, he always seems to find the bottom corner uh, whenever he has a shot and goal as well. So a fantastic season for him, interrupted obviously by injury once again. But if we see a full Michael Elise season without any injury, Boy, we're looking at a 15-goal, 10-assist type season with what he can do. So really, really impressive for him this year. Coming now to the priorities for next season, the number one has to be keep Elise and Eze, or at least one of them. These guys are the difference makers. As I said, when they both play, the difference from Palace is stark. They play with more confidence. They look like they can go after the end because they know they can score more goals in their opposition. And they just cause defences so many problems. Even the big teams, you can't you know, just play a high line versus Crystal Palace because the way they press... And the way you've got these superstars in the front line, you've got to just give yourself a bit more space. So as such, defensive lines go back and Palace can go and drive at teams and get at teams. And obviously the midfield dominance has helped them, but boy, they're, they're just a difference maker. They make Palace tick. They give them confidence to play their style of football. And obviously the moments of brilliance they can whip out just basically wins games of their own feet. So at least one of them, you've got to try and keep at least one. If you can keep both, I think you're looking at Europa League football next season, the way they're kept going. Um, Another priority is going to be defensive depth and so maybe some new centre-halves to have some quality. The Anderson, Gahey's come back, but you might want some more defensive cover, some depth, maybe even a starter to add in there, especially if you're going to play that five back with the three centre-halves. I think you don't really want to be playing Nathaniel Klein at centre-half next season. You want three really versatile, high-paced, you know, strong centre-halves. You look at the Mickey van der Ven's of the world, try and get someone across um, from other European leagues that might be a little bit cheaper rather than spending in the Prem we know they've been so good in getting some young English talent as well. So to find that out, but I think defensive depth, especially at the wing-back position as well, Munoz and Mitchell have to work very, very hard throughout next season. So you're going to have to have some support for them to get a bit of squad rotation at key points in time. And the third is to continue to play Glasner's high-energy, high-attacking style of football. It's a lot of high-pressing, a lot of energy. It's going to be taxing on the players, but you've seen the results. The turnaround's been fantastic coming out of the season, and it's so important next year you implement that from the start of the season. You give Glasner the money to buy the players he wants, and important if you lose Eze or Lise to replace those guys because that system worked to a you know, superb extent, beating Liverpool at Anfield and yeah, knocking four past Man United, beating Liverpool and uh, Newcastle quite comfortably at home as well. So you're taking it to, like, to Chelsea. So they've got the structure there. They've got the identity. You've got to keep with it. And that means you have to make some smart signings come the summer. So listen to what the manager wants. You've obviously got big respect for him. Give him what he needs. And next season could be fantastic. Because as I said, you keep most of the players here. If Matet is in sort of 7 out of 10 of what he's done at the end of the season here, I think you're looking at sort of a 7th or 6th place finish because of how dynamic this team is. There's not many that can stop Palace when they're firing. Uh, and defensively, they've been quite solid as well at the back. So... If you take the last three months, you translate that over the next season. You know, Brighton's a, a bit of a rebuilding phase. Man, you know, we don't know what we're going to get with them. Chelsea's an unknown right now as well. How do Liverpool go with a new manager? There's a chance for someone else to break in there. West Ham have a new manager as well. So there's a real chance for a team outside of that big group to jump in there. I think it could be Palace's year. I'm very bullish on their chances, especially with Oliver Glass on the wheel. I think he has got to go down as a top five manager in the Premier League right now with how he's revolutionised his side. And so quickly. Coming in mid-season, normally you see managers go pragmatic, you just go survive the year. He's gone in, turned a relegation side into a mid-table side and done it playing very fashionable style of football. So excited to see that. Um, that brings you the season grade. There's been downs, but there's been a massive up come the end of the season. And maybe this is a bit unders, but I guess taking it as a whole, I've given them a B plus. Fantastic turnaround, fantastic performances, fantastic style of football. It's progressive, it's for the future, and it's adaptable going forward. So very excited to see what they can do next year. And I think as a whole, Roy Hodgson did what he had to do with this side across the last sort of year. He got he kept them up. He played some all right football, but they were just limited by what he could do with them. You've got a manager now that's modern, that can play a progressive style of football, that's come from Germany, knows how that German style of football works, and is implementing it in the Premier League. And you know, I've got to say, international managers coming to the Premier League normally do very well. Pep Guardiola, um, you look at the likes of Jurgen Klopp, now Oliver Glasner, Andoni Iriola. There's a common trend there. They've come from Europe, they've come with a more progressive mindset, and they've brought it to the Premier League. And I think it's going to work once again here with Crystal Palace. With that all being said, ladies and gents, that brings the recap to an end. Let me know what you think in the comment section down below. Have they got the season grade for Palace right? Who do you think is their player of the season? Who's been the breakout player for them? Let me all know that in the comment section down below. 
Please make sure if you enjoyed the video, guys, smash a like and subscribe to the Players End channel for more content like this and press that post notification bell so you know we upload our podcasts and videos here in the channel. With that all being said, ladies and gents, I hope you have the rest of your day. Enjoy the upcoming football and I'll see you guys for another video very, very soon. Till next time, guys. See you later.